Hi, everyone, and welcome to a special MS Translate video interview. And it's my pleasure today to be joined by Dr. Barry Singer, who's going to be providing us with an update on all of the exciting research that was recently presented at the 2022 Actrums Conference. So while many of our community are probably well aware of you, uh, Dr. Singer, from the work that you do in terms of keeping people living with MS informed online, um, maybe can we just start with you giving a brief introduction to, to who you are um, and your interest in multiple sclerosis? All right. Thanks, Brett. And thanks for having me on MS Translate. Um, so I've been working in MS so for over 25 years and I've uh, been treating people with multiple sclerosis. I run a comprehensive MS center called the MS Center for Innovations and Care at uh, Missouri Baptist Medical Center. That's in St. Louis in USA. And uh, I've been uh, involved in clinical research for a long, long time and have been an investigator in greater than 35 clinical trials. Um, as a patient advocate, I started MS Living Well in 2007, and, which is a website with uh, patient education information um, back in the early days when um, there wasn't really much information um, out there uh, in terms of people searching for answers about MS. So I've been involved in that educational space. And, uh, and about four years ago, I started the MS Living Well podcast. And I'm also, as a patient advocate, I'm uh, on the board of directors for the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America for the past six years. I think people will now know why I'm so excited to have you on MS Translate to do this interview. Obviously, as we were saying just before we, we started recording this, there's a lot of overlap in terms of, of your goals and, and MS Translate. So it's fantastic to have you on here. As I said at the start, um, you recently attended the, the Actrums conference and provided a lot of fantastic information online for us who weren't able to attend, unfortunately, this year um, to stay up to date with. But can you tell us from your perspective what some of the key topics were at the meeting this year? Yeah, the theme of uh, the meeting is something called biomarkers. And so biomarkers are a way of kind of measuring disease. So biomarkers can help you diagnose a disease, monitor a disease. Some of you are probably familiar with people with diabetes. We measure hemoglobin A1C to look at your blood sugar or cholesterol. We look at your lipid panel. So um, with MS, we're starting to explore these biomarkers that can be even on MRI imaging, blood tests. So that was really the theme. Uh, it was pretty scientific, um, but uh, some interesting insights into the disease and how we might improve care in the future. Okay, fantastic. So I guess from your perspective, again, what were some of the most exciting things that you heard at the meeting that, that people living with MS will, will be interested in? Yeah, so there was a few major themes that I kept seeing coming through. Um, one of their early presentations was on comorbidities. And comorbidities are having other conditions besides MS. Uh, for example, some of our patients with MS have other autoimmune diseases or um, hypertension or diabetes. And, and unfortunately, if you have these other comorbidities, the more you have, the more likely you are to have faster disability progression of your multiple sclerosis. So it's important to try to control those. Um, some we can control in terms of uh, weight loss, eating right, you might be able to get rid of some of those comorbidities, but uh, one of the things we looked at, in addition, um, psychiatric uh, conditions can also increase your risk. So having, um, we know depression, anxiety are very common with MS and there's even higher incidence of bipolar disorder in people with multiple sclerosis. High cholesterol was actually also shown to increase the risk of MS relapses. Um, so again, that's something that needs to be addressed. Another, uh, speaking of kind of diet, so another interesting area was uh, microbiome. And so the microbiome is the, you know, trillions of, of organisms that live in our gut and they really affect our immune system. And there's a lot of interesting research on this. And one study, uh, I hopefully you haven't eaten recently, but they actually took fecal matter from older patients and younger people with MS and put them into animals, into mice, and looked at how they did in a kind of a mouse model. And the mice that got the human, uh, the older uh, fecal material actually ended up with more disability. So there may be some things, changes in the gut of people living with MS that influences disability. Another study looked at pediatric MS and looked at the gut and saw what was different about kids with MS compared to um, healthy adults without MS. And there was a couple species of organisms living in the gut um, in kids with MS, pediatric onset MS. One of them was called Bladia species. Another one is called Fecobacterium 
Prozaninsky, uh, mouthful, but uh, these uh, bugs may be driving it. And so we need to learn more about the microbiome. Another, uh, another kind of interesting point is speaking of kids with MS, um, we have a lot of research you probably heard about Epstein-Barr virus and triggering, uh, and triggering um, MS. And it was a big study in US military looking at um, Epstein-Barr virus triggering multiple sclerosis. So almost everybody with MS has been exposed to the Epstein-Barr virus, but 95% of the general population has. So the interesting thing, this study looked at children uh, with MS, and they found that about um, they found about 13% of children with the diagnosis of MS never had EBV. They never had Epstein-Barr virus. So that's interesting. And of those kids that did not have Epstein-Barr virus and they had a diagnosis of MS, it turned out that 44% of them actually had another condition. They had MOG. And MOG is an antibody that attacks myelin. So these kids that did not, if you haven't been exposed to body Epstein-Barr virus, then you start need to think maybe you got something else. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, another big topic, speaking of biomarkers, is MRI. So um, there's some hot topics in MRI that are out there. One of them is something called paramagnetic rim lesions. And so what does this mean? So magnets um, is a magnetic signal you can see with iron. And myelin and cells that make myelin called oligos have iron in them. And when there's destruction in, by a lesion, that iron is taken up by cells. And these cells um, are called microglia. And they are around the rim of a lesion. So if you see a, like a lesion in the brain, you've got a rim of these microglia cells that are picking up all that iron. And you can actually see that in MRI. And this leads to these chronic active lesions. Uh, and sometimes we see this uh, in patients with early disability, we see these rim lesions. And it's kind of a failure repair, of a repair of the myelin, and it's kind of chronic inflammation. So we've also seen people that um, very early in MS that can trigger uh, people that develop these are more likely to have MS. And so I think there's a lot of growing research on that front. Another area that people have been looking at is central vein sign. And in um, up to 79% of people, uh, lesions in the brains of people with multiple sclerosis have a central vein. And so what that means is if you look closely using the right tools on MRI, you can actually see a vein inside the lesion uh, and you can actually see that on MRI. And so some people have white matter spots from high blood pressure or migraine, and those, those white matter spots don't have veins. So I think it's going to help not only with the diagnosis of MS, um, but also, um, you know, something that we can monitor over time. And then finally, one of the other challenges is, you know, who's going to go on to develop progressive MS, secondary progressive MS. And uh, there was an interesting program uh, that was done at UCSF where the um, University of California, San Francisco, where they use regular MRIs of the brain. And when you do an MRI of the brain, you get a little bit of the spinal cord um, up at top. And if you look at how thick that spinal cord is, it also predicted secondary progressive MS. So if you had thinning of that area in the spinal cord, you were more likely to have progressive disease. So that was a pretty exciting MRI uh, update. One other imaging thing that's important is we've also been looking at ways to repair myelin. And so repairing myelin is um, something that we're very interested in. And there was some new techniques looking at repairing um, myelin on MRI so, or other imaging techniques. One of them is called myelin water imaging. Another one called magnetization transfer imaging and diffuser tensor imaging. So there's new techniques that maybe we can visualize myelin repair. So uh, when we get those compounds in clinical trial, we want to try them out, see if we can restore uh, some of that damage that's been done, uh, having important MRI techniques to help validate these medications, to make sure these medications are working is really important. Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic overview of, of what sounds like it was a very exciting conference. One of the best things about getting to interview someone else about these meetings is that I get to sit here while you have to be the one that says all of the big words, and so I don't need to stumble on them. So that was that was very pleasing for me. Um, I mean, you touched upon a lot of 
um, areas of research there that we know are really interesting to the MS community, particularly because they they touch on lifestyle modifications and things that people living with multiple sclerosis can do in their everyday life to take a bit more control over the management of their disease. And we hear regularly from our community, and I'm sure you do as well, that you know that's something that they're they're really interested in and want to see more of. So when you talk about things like diet like exercise to reduce these comorbidities um, how the gut microbiome may be involved and obviously there may be ways of modifying that a little bit further down the track but i guess for for people living with multiple sclerosis who are watching this what are some of the key messages in terms of things that they might be able to do now or that people are looking into in terms of things that they may be able to do to control their their ms yeah, I think you're totally right on board is trying to reduce those comorbidities are going to make a big difference. And so, you know, some of those uh, like diabetes and hypertension, sometimes some weight loss and exercise could really make a big difference. So I think that's really important to try to reduce those so you're not stacking up new problems. Um, you know, some is out of our control, you know, some things are genetic, you know, some people have high cholesterol because their father had it and their grandmother had it, you know, so some things you can't control. Um, but those that you can control can help. I mean, one of the challenges, especially those listeners out there that have significant disability, um, unfortunately, if you have a lot of disability, it's hard to burn a lot of calories, right? So if your mobility goes down, it's hard to burn the same calories. So you really have to focus on diet, uh, which is always challenging. Um, but you want to do those things that make things um, better for you. There's some great data that wasn't presented at this meeting, but uh, looking at smoking um, out of the UK registry. And so thousands of patients were studied and people that quit smoking ended up doing much better. Smoking leads to much more cognitive impairment um, as well as physical disability. So that's definitely a huge thing uh, to put on your list. Um, I, I tell people, find a new vice. <laughs> that one's not going to work for you. And so um, those are really important. As a, you know, one of the other um, pretty fascinating things that happened at the meeting that we also were talking about is kind of the future of where we're going with MS and how to really monitor the disease and make sure that the disease is in check. One of the themes was biomarkers. So we look at um, some of the changes that are happening in cells within the nervous system. One of the most important certain the nerve cell is the nerve cell, the neuron. And the neuron has uh, proteins in it called neurofilament. And neurofilament are important structural proteins that keep the, keep the nerve intact. And if there's injury to the nerve, um, neurofilament leaks out into the spinal fluid and, and then subsequently into the blood. And so there's a lot of research looking at this biomarker and people that have active disease, active MS, as neurofilament light levels go up. And there's um, a few other markers that have been looked at. And in fact, uh, one, um, one presentation was looking at an array of these uh, different biomarkers that we could use as a blood test. So about 18 different proteins would be looked at, and we could tell who is having active MS uh, based on active lesions on the MRI and predict uh, patients going on a secondary progressive MS. So we may soon have blood tests that we can actually monitor patients over time, which is uh, pretty fascinating. Yeah, I mean, anything that helps us stay more on top of what's going on so that we can make quicker decisions. Right. I mean, there's a lot of research now suggesting that the speed in which we can get people onto an effective treatment is hugely important for, for long-term outcomes. So, I mean, that that's really important. And we've already seen, going back to the EBV study that you talked about, um, their use of neurofilament light in that study um, to be able right. to monitor people pre um, becoming infected with EBV and post and seeing when that neurofilament light first turned up as a marker of damage, already seeing the benefits of that. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's going to be very useful. And then I think we just got to get to the point where we're monitoring patients individually. Uh, I think a lot of patients, uh, a lot of patients do not like the MRI scanner. <laughs> so a lot of claustrophobia in this world. And uh, so the ability to get a blood test to look for active disease without necessarily going to the MRI scan so frequently would be very useful. Yeah, definitely. So from your point of view, um, with all of this fantastic research that's going on, what studies or study or studies are you most interested in seeing how they develop over the, the next little while? For me personally, I'm really interested in seeing the EBV story has probably been one of the biggest stories to start 2022. And I think 
the the results from that are very interesting. I still think there's a lot of questions that need to be asked because I guess we're at a point now where we think it's it's necessary but not sufficient. And so what those other factors are that are coming into play, um, I think that will be really interesting. But from your point of view, what are you most interested in in following over the next 12 months? No, I totally agree with you. I think part of it is that the CVB story really opens up uh, a lot. Um, uh, and uh, I had the opportunity to interview Alberto Iscario from Harvard, who actually did the study on the MS Living Well podcast, uh, Cause and the Cure podcast. And so we talked about, you know, what are the next steps? And I think one very interesting step is um, Moderna, who makes one of the uh, COVID-19 vaccines is doing a study of vaccinating young adults uh, for EBV um, to prevent them from getting EBV. So the, really the goal is if you could vaccinate people with uh, before they got Epstein-Barr virus, potentially you could cure MS or prevent MS. Now the question is, does the vaccine just prevent partial infection or full infection, um, but we might be able to stop MS by uh, doing that. And another very interesting observation is uh, this was a study I saw presented at a conference meeting years ago, a Congress meeting was looking at HIV um, and MS. And what we found is that um, the if you look in the UK, like a huge uh, database of national health service, you found that uh, the amount of people that had um, HIV and MS was very low. And the question was, it's always been, are these antiviral medications doing something? Um, are they suppressing the disease? So now it circles back to EBV. And um, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see the role there. I, um, the other, I think, very interesting area is looking at progressive disease. And there's a couple strategies uh, being looked at. There's a class of medications called BTK inhibitors, which there's a number of them out there in clinical trials. I'm doing clinical trials as well. And what these drugs, uh, BTK inhibitors, are on the, um, they affect microglia, which are um, the cells that I mentioned around these uh, lesions, these chronic active lesions have these microglia cells. And um, this class of drugs targets B cells and microglia. So I think that's going to be an interesting um, area of research and, and looking at there's trials going on in all different types of MS, from relapsing remitting to secondary progressive to primary progressive MS. So hopefully uh, we'll make some headway in the progressive MS uh, by targeting these cell types. Yeah, definitely. I think um, for, for people living with MS who are watching this interview, I, I hope that they're heartened by hearing about all of the exciting research that's going on. Obviously, lots of different areas, lots of things to look forward to that we hope you know, we'll generate some some really significant results and improvements for, for people living with MS um, in the near future. Thank you very much for your time today. You, you mentioned in that previous discussion there around your podcast. So we very much encourage all of our MS Translate community to, to start following you online and, and staying up to date with all of the information that you're publishing. For them, um, what's their easiest way to, to follow you? And, and do you have any sort of final messages that you'd like to share with our community? Sure. Um, so um, I'm the host of the MS Living Well podcast, and I interview MS experts from around the globe. Um, actually, this week, I, uh, I just interviewed someone from Spain. I have uh, someone tomorrow, uh, double hitter, someone from Mayo and Harvard, and then uh, someone from John Hopkins next week uh, on Friday. So busy schedule, but uh, we roll them out on all kinds of different topics, and I usually pick two experts on each topic. So check it out. Um, and then I'm on Twitter at Dr. Barry Singer. And the podcast is MS Living Well, is, which is the same as the website. So I got a lot of animation, videos, all kinds of information about the disease, um, treatment, and, uh, and I even have a blog. So you can surf through. There's you know tons of posts there. So you can search by whatever topic you're interested in. So check out mslivingwell.org as well. Okay, fantastic. Well, we'll make sure that we include all of the links to all of those platforms underneath these videos um, so people can, can stay up to date with all that you're doing. Thank you again for your time. It's been, it's been fantastic to hear from you. Okay, best wishes to everybody out there. And uh, thanks so much, Brett, and MS Translate for inviting me on. Thanks, Barry.